welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. How does a husband, father of two girls, an entrepreneur whose business pre-COVID required him to be on over 150 plane rides a year, crisscrossing the country, be the light that his family needs him to be? Knowing who you are and what you want as a person, spouse or partner, and parent are the critical elements that help people keep stress and financial strife out of their relationships. An essential component that allows Dennis Mosley Williams to do just this is simple. Every 60 days, he has something fun to look forward to. Dennis talks with great passion about building and living for the memories and experiences of life, not status or material possessions that people think may make them happy. Please enjoy my conversation with Dennis Mosley Williams. What I want to prime the pump for all the, the listeners is, is that you talk a lot about the experience economy, yeah. different kinds of experience. But today, we're going to talk about the Dennis Mosley experience. And more specifically, we're going to answer two questions, or I'm going to really go after you on two questions is, okay. A, how did you and Sherry stay married before COVID? And B, how are you and St- Sherry staying married after COVID? And the reason... <laughs> And, and the reason is, is your business requires you some years to be on a plane. I think you've told me 126 times. So let's just start yeah. there and talk about what your business is and how it required you or previously required you before COVID to be on the plane 126 times. Okay. So um, I work as a consultant more more often in the financial services industry. And uh, I'm a recognized expert in the field of customer experience. And as you're, you know, I use this term really loosely, as you're, you're certainly aware, like I was going to say, you're a fan. You're aware of the experience economy and the work I do in the money business. So as you know, um, customer service and customer experience are very different things. So just for everybody listening at home, in layman's terms, as it were, I turn coffee shops, regular coffee shops, let's say, into more of a quote unquote, but not literal Starbucks. And what I teach people as we do that is it's not just about hanging nicer art or putting on cooler music. Customer experience is a very distinct economic offering, and there's a lot of thinking that goes into it. But in layman's terms, I turn businesses into experiences. Forget delivering services. Forget what you do. I help you figure out a way to engage with your clients and bring them value. That's what I do. And previously, before COVID, um, I spoke at conferences all over the place, um, as far as, you know, Davos, Switzerland, et cetera, in Europe, et cetera, but mostly all over the United States. And that would facilitate, I'd have to fly. So I hate, here it is. You ready for this? Oh no, I'd fly at least 120 sometimes a year. It was closer like to 150. And a bad year, which in many ways could be a good year, it would be 200. It's crazy. That's, that's, I once flew when I was working in my corporate career um, at Lazy Boy, I was on 80 segments one year. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's good flying right there. Yeah. And I made like, I don't know, was it platinum or whatever on segments? And I was yeah. telling somebody about it. And it's like, that's insane. Like, you know, it's usually make, make that level out like on miles. And no, I made that's it right. on segments because yeah. all of our manufacturing plants were located in areas of the country where it required most times a two plane ride to get there. That's you're describing my life. I got a, I have like this, as a Canadian, I have outrageous status with, Air Canada. Like if I, I could tell you hero stories about Air Canada, that would freak you out. 
And by the way, we should let everyone know you're you're located in Ottawa. Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Das Kapital. Yeah. So I got a buddy who lives here and he and I have the same status with Air Canada. And then one day he realized how I earned mine, which is the hard way segments. So he goes, oh my goodness. He goes, Dennis, I do it on miles. I'm like, oh yeah. So this is my friend Huss. He'll fly from Ottawa to like Jordan or Yemen. And he'll do that a few times a year. We'll figure it out. So yeah, I earned all my status literally flying to like Denver, Cleveland, you know, Philly, Florida, from Florida to, I think just before the pandemic blew in, it went like this. It was like, auto. so I had meetings in, Jesus, how did it go? It was like Miami, California, New York, Vegas, home for, uh, back to Baltimore or Washington, D.C., and then home. Okay, and that, that was, was like, one week? Yeah, and that was, and that's not like, yeah, what a week, eh? It's like, that was just a week. It just happened to be the last week before COVID. Oh yeah, man. I think I flew from Davos, Switzerland to Honolulu. To, and, and people hear that and they go, that's crazy. And it's like, yeah. And the whole time, like, just think about all that. It's like, how much time were you actually working? It's like, well, you could argue sitting on the airplanes working. Having said that, I spoke for less than 60 minutes at each event. You went all the way to Switzerland and spoke for 45 minutes. Yes. And then flew all the way to Honolulu and did the same thing. And that's how, that's actually how we met. Um, I think three years ago here in, in, in Detroit, there was a financial planning association conference. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys that you're connected with brings you in every so often. That's right. And that just happened to be the year I was there. And when I heard you talk about this experience economy, and we'll talk about this later on as we, as our conversation goes on, I got, I got hooked. And oh, yeah. It'd be interesting to see if I if if uh, I get any feedback from family office clients that listen to this, on if they've seen the progression of of Tama, my firm, from service to more experience, because right. that's what I'm trying to drive to. Um, so let's back up now that little everybody has a little bit of background of Dennis and what you do. Mm-hmm. How did you end up getting into this, and then more importantly? How how did that change your finan- your family dynamic with you and Sherry? Because you have two girls, and we'll get into your family life here in more detail yeah. in a minute. But you've got two girls now. Um, but were you traveling all that time when you and Sherry first started dating or married, or how did that go? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was I was starting out. In fact, um, I just got. I, it's cool. It's. I just got started. Nope. Um, I got a lucky break like so many of us do. Okay. And at the time it was, you know, it's so funny. I can remember music. I'm thinking back to, yeah, what was my early road music? What were the songs I was listening to, you know, when I was first starting out, but I got a little, I got the opportunity and it just took off. So what I had figured out And I don't want to, I know that we're not talking about experience economy per se here today. We're talking about sort of the mental gymnastics, the politics and poetics of keeping it all together, Right. your life when you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of 24 hours on. Okay. So I realize that's what we're here to talk about. So I just want to say to everybody so they can appreciate this. I never figured out what the heck I figured out. Like when I stumbled into how huge this was, I wasn't even smart enough to figure out that I had at this time, by the way, mid 1990s, this term didn't exist. I had gone viral and I didn't know. So I went from being just a regular person who had a job and was working to being invited to speak at a conference to thinking, oh, that's cool, to going to the conference, to experiencing what has become very normal for me, which is to walk off stage and always build in X amount of time afterwards for the next person to book you. So I went from homebody to gone for six months a year and it happened virtually overnight. And that six months, I want you to know, it's not like I'm deployed like a soldier who just to say that breaks my heart. Like I couldn't imagine somebody saying you're going to go away for six months. Like I would just never do that job. I go away previously and I assume things will go back to some form of next normal. I'm away like two, three days a week, constantly until I, again, formally, 
because we're living under COVID right now. So, you know, I met you at the FPA in Detroit and in about an hour, I'm keynoting the FPA conference in Washington, DC, right from the same place, brother. It's fantastic. Um, so I would take big chunks of the summer off as well and just be with my family in the, uh, at the cottage. So when you, when you and Sherry got married yeah. and you were doing the traveling, yeah. how, how did that work from a, a family dynamic? Obviously she knew what you did and yeah. she knew you were going to be gone a lot. Yeah. Like, how did that work? Did Sherry have a career at the time or? Yeah. Sherry's a school teacher. So, you know, there's two things I'm going to get to. I have little girls, as you've mentioned. So I tell them all the time, marry a funny man. Because <laughs> okay. honest to goodness, like, I mean this sincerely, funny gets you through. Do you know that company, Life Isn't Easy? Or no, what the hell is it called? Life is Good? Life, the t you see it on yeah. t-shirts, coffee mugs. Okay. It's one of my favorite companies. Their full sort of statement is, life isn't easy. Life isn't fair. Life is good. Okay. That's how it ends. Okay. So... Um, Sherry's a school teacher. Everything is a okay. I suddenly start flying like crazy and you reference getting married. Okay. You ready? We eloped. It's come up twice now in, in this conversation in Hawaii, when I was there speaking at a conference and we've been talking <laughs> about getting married and we'd been, you know, living in sin for come some wonderful time. Wonderful sin, by the way. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly recommend it. Living in sin, just some sin in general is good for your soul. Um, so, and we've been planning to get married and like a lot of entrepreneurs, I was telling myself all kinds of lies, i.e. well, you shouldn't get married until you have more money in the bank. You shouldn't get married until you know if you can make a go of this business. You shouldn't, and then, you know, take it to the next level. I didn't have children until I was 36 and 41 for all the same reasons. It's like I had this false sense of uh, a, a desire for security that never, that I didn't, that was crazy. I didn't need to do that. Sometimes I wish I would have had them a little younger for sure. Well, it, that's, <laughs> this is really ironic. I've known you for a few years now and we've built a personal relationship, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, Teresa and I basically eloped in Hawaii <laughs> <laughs> and we had kids late. Like we had the triplets when I was 30 at sea. Uh, they're, they're just turned 10. So I must, we, I was 34, Teresa was 36. And then when we had Mac, I must've been like 36 and she was 38. Yeah. So, um, so you, oh. you, you, your, your career starts taking off. You lope yeah. in Hawaii, you and Sherry lope in Hawaii. Yeah. And then you come back and you, you're, you're, you're traveling and Sherry's a school teacher. How do you oh. make it work? Pre-kids. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but I'll tell you what, it's, I think it's regular life stuff. I think that most people have no idea what they actually want. Like you need to know who you are and what you want. And you need to know that all the things you want are things that you want, not that other people want for you. You know, you get caught in that race. Yeah. Bigger house, bigger this. Now we, we've achieved this. Well, we can't be happy. Like we wear, people tend to wear how hard they work, like a badge of honor. And I never have. I just last evening uh, had a little a social distance visit with a buddy of mine who works in this building. And I say, he was, I said to him, well, you and I've had this conversation a million times. I said, you know, people work too hard and they're proud of themselves. And he says, oh yeah. I said, okay, well, I never was, as you know, do you know how hard I'm working right now? Imagine how I feel. I said, <laughs> as right now, these are strange times for all of us, right? We're all working a little differently, a little harder. The learning curve's a little straight up. So um, it's about knowing who you are and what you want to do. You've got to get really choosy. Like if I said to everybody out there, let me tell you what my life will be like again, okay? I say no to stuff. I take eight weeks off in the summer and go to the cottage. I ski about 30 days a winter. Okay, so right away, it's like, sign me up. Tell me more. Who's this guy? I Eight weeks off, you had me sold. It's like, you would, most people wouldn't be able to do that because they can't say no to revenue. I can say no to revenue because... I'm guided by different stars. For me, it's not about stuff. It's experience and time off. I like to feel like I'm not just in control, but like I'm getting away with it. So yes. really it's like, who the hell are you two? What did you want? Are you talking all the time? 
Are you staying on the same page? Are you working through it together? You're a financial planner. Come on, you see this all day long. I, again, everybody listening, I'm not an expert for God's sakes. I'm just a person. But am I wrong here? Or, or maybe I'm onto something? Here it is. You know, you look at the divorce rate. It's really high. It's so high, one wonders why you'd ever get married. Like literally, it's like, you're probably going to fail. Like what? <laughs> okay. So this is what I say to Sherry. There's two things I'll share. One is I, I've got this rule I follow. Every 60 days, you got to have something fun to do that you're looking forward to, a sense of escape, okay? It's just, it's been one of my rules I've lived with forever. Again, under COVID, this has been really tough. You're looking, uh, you're talking to a guy here who hasn't had any fun, asterisks, like actual fun since last March. I've had amusing times. I've had nice walks with my kids. I've had some laughs around the house. Every day has not, you know, been a chore necessarily, but I haven't been to a restaurant since March. I haven't gone skiing this winter. I haven't done anything fun. I haven't checked gone away for a weekend, right? You always got to have something to look forward to every 60 days. Here's the other. So I say to Sherry, people get divorced because they have no fun. Can you imagine? I'm just going to share, like imagine being you or me. I'm a 49 year old man. So I say, can you imagine you're 49 years old? And you're just broke. And all you do is work to pay your debt off. Like I look at people that make, I know that make less than me. And I look in their driveways and think, how do you afford that? I can't drive that car. Like, I'm just going to be put it on the table. Like, wow, I can't afford that car. And I made a hundred grand <clears throat> last month. You know what I mean? And I, I, can't, I can't afford to drive your car. And then you think, well, you must be paying off all kinds of debt. Me? No, I just like to take all kinds of time off. So everybody's bu buying distraction, big TVs, cars, every, everybody I know lives like a millionaire. Everybody I know gets on jets, flies away. It's like, when I grew up as a kid, I didn't know anybody that did this. And you're all the kids I grew up with. How the hell are you guys doing this? And I, you can't. So the first is have fun, keep it easy. Don't put so much on your plate. And the second is I say to Sherry, and I'm sure everybody listening has had this moment. At least I hope you have. Okay, every once in a while I bump into somebody I that knows me from long ago. Uh, you know, it happens. I'll always walk away. And it's like I'll say to Sherry, yeah, I saw Paul. Remember Paul? Oh, I, I bumped into Paul. That was the craziest thing. I haven't seen Paul in, and I, you know, you start to be 49 years old, you start hearing yourself things say things like, I haven't seen that guy in 20 years. Right. I haven't seen okay. And I'll say to Sherry. He, uh, no, I'm just using you as an example, bro. That's okay. <laughs> say, I get it. That guy looks old. Just hear me out. I'll say, is he our luck? I just meet these people sharing. I think, what? You're 50? What the hell happened to you? Like, I don't look like you. And then I laugh and I say, of course, you know what they're saying? Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's like, you know, they walk away going, what the hell happened to Dennis? Jesus. They were looking old, you know? Sherry says to me, no, no, they don't think that. Okay, and she's not paying me a compliment. Then she points out the obvious. You have not had financial strife. It, it, it's not on your face. You're a smiley guy, Dennis. I'm gonna tell, I got offered that. I, remember this, I wanna go back to something I said a minute ago about saying no. So one day I get this phone call and it's out of the blue. Some guys drop the ball ferociously. Dennis, will you make this for me? Can you do this? Can you, you know, falls in my lab. Will you make this corporate thing for us? Da, 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 da. And Paul, it's like 80% in my wheelhouse. Meaning, oh boy, if I had to, I could probably crank that thing out in three days if I had to, but I didn't have to. So I thought on it long and hard and I, I tell the guy, no. And he literally says, really? Like he lets me know it's yours. You know, if you say no, that I respect you, I'm going to pick up the phone and call so-and-so and hand it to him. Do you really not want this. I say, yeah, and I'll tell you why, because it's going to complicate my life. It doesn't quite fit right now. And just hear me out while the check is exciting. It's like, how much would you charge us for this? Like 150. Okay. That's what I thought to build this thing. So while the check is exciting, this is what I would have to do. And I just explained, I'd probably have to get a bit of help on it, change some things in my personal life. Okay. So that's why I'm not going to do it. Sorry to frustrate, but I just got to live by the rules I set here. Okay. And again, how much is enough? Eventually you get to this point, right? So he goes, can I tell you something? 
the guy that I'm going to hand this to told me the exact same thing you told me. He told me every time he does something like this, makes a change, he regrets he didn't. I know the guy personally that he's telling me about, and I know what he drives. So he's saying to me, I don't want to say who it is, but he tells me enough that I go, I know exactly who it is. Is it this guy? And he goes, yeah, do, do, you know, do you know, can you, you know, just keep this between us? Right. I'm like, oh, of course. So here I'm talking to you about it, but I'm not sharing names, but I know that man and the car he drives. So I say, well, I'll tell you what, Jim, you can tell him that this is a gift from me to him, both the work he can have and this bit of advice. He wouldn't have to say yes if he didn't drive a Porsche. <laughs> okay. Soon as you start bigger housing, bigger carrying, this and that. It's like you put too much on the cuff, you lose the shirt on your back, it causes all kinds of stress in your business, in your house. It's brutal. So you, this is where I was going next. And then as usual, you hit the nail on the head, enough, defining enough. Yeah. And you know, another person, I, I um, Brian Portnoy, who's a, a friend of both of ours. Yeah, love who's, him. Who's, who's got this concept called funded contentment. Uh, I think I've, I think I was the first person to fall in love with that. Uh, so um, for those listening, I'll link to our conversation with Brian in the show notes that we just had uh, here recently. Um, but Brian is author of funded or uh, he's the author of the geometry of wealth. And basically he leads off the book with deciding how do you decide what is enough? Yeah. And I think that's a challenge for everybody, myself included. Because I'm in the same, you know, we're in different industries, but, you know, if, if I want to keep growing, I can keep growing. But then where's the, where do I cut the line? Where do I say, okay, this is enough. Yeah. And so Brian does a really great job of, of talking about this whole concept of funded contentment. And that's actually one of the things I'm excited about working with the families at Tama about is helping them figure out what enough is because it goes back to your point of trying to reduce this financial strife that, you know, keeping up with, you know, all the neighbors and things like that. Yeah. It, it's really difficult. And it, I don't think people really realize how much damage or maybe not dam well, probably damage, but stress they put each other under in a marriage because of trying to keep up with people financially. Yeah. And it's, and it starts with your own, I, I bet, I bet you could talk about this all day. How many people come in to see you and it's the opposite and they just realize how much trouble they're in. No, they realize they already have enough. No, they figure out that they're way, well, like way further ahead than they realized they were. I think part of this starts with know thyself, right? And what you want and what makes you happy. That's a big part of it. And understanding also that we are, this is not from me. I, somebody said this once. I was like, gosh, that's brilliant. I have no idea who said it. They said, we are all failed meditators. And went on to explain, like, when you're watching TV, so I just had this experience the other day, and you're watching commercials, you don't realize it, but you're absorbing that. You are actually meditating on the commercial. You're sitting there thinking to yourself, do I need an F-150 pickup truck? So recently, like I don't have any TV of any, I have uh, streaming services like everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Netflix and the rest of them. But with this COVID thing going on, it's like, I could use a bit of distraction. So I wouldn't mind watching a little bit of NBA basketball. No big deal. So to do so, I had to download this app and suddenly I'm watching like sports TV, just one channel to watch uh, Toronto Raptors games or what have you. Well, I've forgotten all about TV commercials. Okay. It's like, holy cow, there's a lot of advertising. I forgot all about this. And everything they're advertising to you is for stuff. You need this, you need that. And the promise is it'll make you happy. When in fact, all it will do is make you a slave. Stuff does not make you happy. It helps. It's fun. But more and more, you know, in the economy, we're moving towards not owning stuff, but just using it. Right. So uh, truly it's, do you have, does, how many people sit down and ask, what do we need to be happy? How did we get here? Where are we going? What's my inspiring vision of success, et cetera? I have never lost that. This, this year has been tough for me because everything has changed. So it's almost like my, my last business, which was perfect, it really is dead. 
And I mean, it's not dead and that's generating, but I mean, no, 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 you have to put it out of your mind and you have to evolve to this next thing. You can't keep holding on to that. You've got to, you know, really innovate. So I've said to Sherry, you know, I got this theme I live by. Okay. And my theme is get away with it. <laughs> okay. Which is to say, I always like to feel like I'm getting away with it. For instance, I took a crack at my buddy with his fancy car. Can I drive a Jeep Wrangler? I love Jeeps. I've owned two. I love them. I love how purpose-built they are. I put bigger tires on them. I adore them. And I actually use it as a Jeep. I also love that the older it gets, the cooler it gets. I like that they don't change what they look like, yada, 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 yada. As a consequence, I feel like I'm getting away with it. Okay. I do pretty well for a guy that drives a car that's 13 years old. Like you would think like, don't you want to go get another one? It's like, no, no, this car just keeps getting cooler. It's, this is about the idea of getting away with it. It's like, no, not only do I love this car, I always feel like I've got this little secret benefit, which is not only is it the cheapest car in down for me to drive, yada, yada, yada. Okay. I love it. I feel like I'm sca- I'm gaming the system here. And that's a big part of my joy. That's, so this year has been really tough because while I'm not flying, I suddenly have what feels to me like a normal job. Like, oh, I get up early. I get here early and I leave uh, after five and I do it five days a week. It's very unusual for me. I don't feel like I'm getting away with anything. So that's been, you know, this year has been really interesting for, for me and certainly for Sherry and I in terms of, uh, you know, needing, needing a little bit more support, et cetera. So will so I want to come back to that the uh, how you've gone about transitioning from your business what it was pre COVID to what it's like now post COVID poorly um, <laughs> but I, but I, I, I'm I'm coming back on point to to stay on this topic of of family with you so so you and Sherry um, you start having kids later in life yep you're still traveling away. How does yeah. that work? Like, how does the travel schedule, how does the business work with you being gone so much and having, you know, new, new these two new girls? The, the, our teammates, the humans, yes. our little people. <laughs> okay, little people. well, so this is all now you're getting, okay, so here it is. So a long time ago, 13 years ago, my business was making enough, okay? Now, everybody's different. I am not a person who needs to go make more. I'm just, that's not how I'm wired. And I would, so I'm not saying there's something wrong with people who are wired. I would just say, you should really do some, some deep dive thinking there on why, you're, why you think so. Like, why? Why do you want to do that? What do you think it's going to bring you? Well, what about this? What about? So the answer to your question is, a million years ago, Sherry became a sub, like a supply teacher. What is that? So be, uh, it's like substitute. Okay. They call you in when someone's sick. So it's sure. not a full-time job, but you can teach every day if you want to. And the idea was, Sherry, I'm away all the time. When I come home, I just want to hang out with you. <laughs> when I don't want to come home and sit in the house by myself. So it was sort of a, a joint decision, which was, hey, when I'm home for a while and they call and you feel like going and teaching, just this morning, Sherry said to me, I miss teaching. It's so fun. Like she misses going into little St. George school at the end of the street and being, you know, Miss Cranston, the substitute teacher, walking through the neighborhood with my wife is a riot, right? In the, she's, she teaches little kids who still think she's magic. They think she lives at the school. So when they see, you remember that when you're a little guy, you'd see your teacher at the grocery store and it just blew you away. Yeah. Like what? They, <laughs> they buy crackers. Okay. So Sherry can walk with me down the street. And in the middle of a sentence with me go, I see you, Paul. And she gives him a nice, friendly teacher voice, you know? So what we did was we decided that what was important to us was just having fun. It's not time working. It's time having fun. Your, your work should be meaningful. It should matter. If you're lucky, like I wouldn't want, I'm so glad I don't go to a job I hate. I'm so glad I own this. I, I own all this, including the challenge of putting it back on the tracks and surviving COVID. I would so much rather have that responsibility than be working for you, hoping you figure it out. You know what I mean? I'm at home at night going, I don't know. Paul seems to have a handle on it. No, I can't do that. In better times, it's time off. Don't lose each other. Okay. What's your goal? What are you working for? And everybody's got to have fun. 
every 60 days. Okay. These are sort of my rules. I was taught by my own financial advisor about staying married. No kidding. Here's the first one. Be a man. Okay. Now hear me out. All kinds of things fall under that first rule. All kinds of do's and don'ts fall under be a grown up here, pal. Okay. But we're going to just stick it for your audience and your arena. It's like, you know, spend less than you earn. Don't turn your wife into your mom. For God's sakes, pick up after yourselves. Like be a partner here, be a dude, be a man. Don't be a, don't, nobody wants to live with a teenager or an idiot. Right. So be I a did man. five loads of laundry yesterday. So I, 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 hopefully I contributed to that. Yeah. <laughs> whenever you reference the triplets, I'm always like, oh yeah, you're an actual man. I am a pretender. Wow. Um, the second thing is listen, right. Got to communicate and talk and listen. Okay. And the third, because people change and you always want to just, you've always been listening to each other. Communication is key. Sharing honestly, openly, right? Oh yeah. And number three, you got to go on dates. <laughs> you got to hold hands and you got to go out. I have share an office space here with my buddy. Under COVID, it's really tough for them to have babysitters and they don't have any family around or what have you. So I said, Hey, you know, as soon as this weather is kind of mild, I would be happy to, cause it's COVID. You got to be careful. I'd be happy to come by your house and meet you outside you load those little kids of yours who are sort of familiar with me, uh, familiar enough that they're not afraid of me or anything like that. You load them into that wagon and I'll just walk them around for an hour. I'll drag them through the neighborhood and you guys can go get a coffee. And I said to him, I can remember early on when, I, when Ella was little, we Sherry and I going for a coffee at Starbucks. That's a big deal. Are you crazy? It was like a weekend. It took 35 yeah. minutes. We'd be home. Oh my goodness, that I just put wind in your sails. So, you know, you tie this into some, some common themes here. You got to feel like you're winning. Like financial planning, you see it all the time. Like, guys, you got to feel like you're winning. You got to feel like that mortgage is going down. You got to feel like you're not just getting up every day and that you got cheated. What the hell happened? How did this happen to me? What would my 18-year-old self say to me right now? How the hell did this happen to you? Well, what happened is you both bought into the dream. And the dream is consumption will lead to your happiness. Again, I look up and down the street. I think, what the hell? Where do all these people get these cars? And it's just every month, it's just going to look what we're doing to children. As I hold my iPhone up from 13 years old, we've just introduced them to a monthly bill, your data plan. What for? Because you're 13, you got to be connected. To what? What do we celebrate online? We celebrate consumption. We set, We advertise things to buy. We're always saying this, buy this, you'll be happy. Buy this. Status. Eat this. Status, 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 status. Stop. What do you want? I got a buddy of mine. He puts himself through these exercises all the time. Okay. He goes, no, I... Uh, I didn't cut my hair for a year. He looked ridiculous. Can you want to said to me? No, I'm not suggesting we all have to do this. This is my best friend. He's a, he's a crazy guy. I said, that's interesting. He goes, yeah, do you want to know why? It's like, yeah. He goes, okay, I'm going to tell you why. I'm a pretty good looking guy. So I go, okay. I give it to him. All right. He goes, yeah. My whole life, because of that, the world has treated me a certain way. I go, yeah. He goes, so I wanted to change that. I wanted to grow my hair weird. I wanted people to react differently to me because I, he said, wanted to learn from that. I wanted to see what that felt like. I wanted to appreciate being someone else. Okay. That's some really, really deep thinking. Like, wow, this is a buddy of mine. He's an amazingly interesting guy. Okay. So you, you just look at us. Like what happens to us? We get consumed by the machinery. Next thing you know, or like how, I went to a dinner party with my wife one time. I get needled for being like Joe happily. You're going to, I'm your favorite client. You don't have Dennis. Tell me you have a pretty nice house on the nicest street you could afford. Mm -hmm. There's a guy building a $2 million house beside me. I said to Sherry, do you realize when I moved in, there was a little British lady that lived next door in a house that was built in the twenties. That was a cottage. And Sherry and I would look at that. Her name is Reed and she's a love. She literally is right. She's so BBC too, it's killed. Okay. <laughs> I'm making a gooseberry flan. She literally said that to me. I looked at her little cottage house and said to Sherry, can you imagine living in there and raising two kids? Okay. Well now Rita has moved to a condo. Some nice man has 
torn her pretty little cottage down and built this monument. Okay. I didn't even know they made windows that big. And I said to Sherry, do you realize that one day you and I, they're going to say, how the hell did they ever live in that house? Yeah. You imagine raising two kids in that house. It's like people build monuments to themselves. They just do crazy stuff. Right. And then they're stuck in it for, and then again, as I say, then they get on that treadmill and all you, and, and now what are you doing? You can't afford to do anything. You got this debt you're trying to ignore. You've bought into the, my house will keep going up in value. And one day I'll unload it. Oh, golly. You're carrying miserable amounts of debt. And now you feel bad about yourself because all your friends are on their way to Ibiza this year. You know what I mean? And once again, it's like, what are we movie stars? Who are all these people going around? What the hell are we doing? That's, it just breaks my heart, candidly. Well, wow, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. But what, I, so where I want, but where I want to go next is, okay, so we've, we've gotten into present day. We've talked about how you and Sherry managed before the, the two girls, yeah. how you guys are managing now or how you manage pre COVID, you know, with the girls. Now I want to zone in on zero in on what's it been like for the last almost year with you being at home all the time and not on planes. Like how's that transition been like at home? Okay. We're going to start with the good. Okay. The good is we're that, you know, I lost, I lost all my business world last March and haven't missed it once. I don't miss planes. I haven't even had a thought like, gee, it'd be nice just to fly an hour to Toronto for an overnight in a hotel where I can order room service, watch a movie and not have to hear these kids. Nope. I've loved every single minute of being home. So that's the good news is I haven't thought, oh, I got to get the hell out of here. No wonder Sherry and I have lasted so long. You know, we've really only been married half as long as we think because I'm never here or whatever. I don't know if I've heard that from anybody else. <laughs> well, because, well, you know, I'm reading a lot of things in the media about like, you know, people are discovering I got to get my husband back to work. He's driving me crazy or right. I got to get these kids back at school. So let me start by saying, I'm happy to tell you, Oh, I'm really happy at home. And everybody at home is really happy having me. Now here's the things that have changed. I now have this really strange job. I have to learn all kinds of new things and not just learn how to not just learn about them, but learn how to do them before last March. I don't think I'd ever had a zoom meeting. Now I have Zoom meetings, like literally from this moment until 5 p.m. Eastern. Like all day long, I'll just be talking into the camera. So there's lots of up, there's lots of learning curve and it's really steep and it's sometimes frustrating and exhausting. And I haven't always been at my best in this last year. I'll just tell you that straight, okay? Um, credit to my wife. When you mentioned that crack about, oh, I did five loads of laundry. Does that make me? And I went, oh my gosh, okay, ready? I haven't touched an appliance other than the coffee maker in a year. Okay, I don't honestly, when you said that, I was like, oh gosh, I haven't done laundry and I haven't made a meal. Holy cow, that means your lady's doing all that. Yes, she is. Yeah, she is. And she's a real hero too. So what I'm doing is I work really hard. Yeah. And I have one goal, which is every night when I get home, I don't want anybody to be worried about me. How's he doing? Is he getting worn out? Nope. My, I am a dad. My job is to go home and love, smile and happy. So how do you do that? Well, I roll it back. I got to accomplish something each day. Like this is a new world. All those plane rides. I also lost hundreds of hours of sitting quietly by myself thinking. <laughs> okay, that's what those plane rides were good for, right? Catching up. So I've had to become much more structured, rigid. Um, as I said to somebody the other day, I'm almost 50 years old and I'm living in a way I've never lived in my life where almost every minute of my workday is scheduled or planned where I sometimes have to say, Ooh, I better put a 20 minute break in the middle of my day here. I've never had to do anything like that. And then, so, and at home, when I'm home, I just, I make sure I spend as much time with my children as I can. Everything's closed. There's not a lot to do. I get them out walking, skiing. Sherry's been taking Mia down skating, et cetera. Um, and ju just that, just being happy and light, happy and light. That's what we say in the house. Be the light, be the light, Paul. Be a smiler, be a happy guy, you know, take the kids on a walk, find the positive. And, you know, this also all tra traces back to this and everybody listening, the guy's a financial planner, phone him. Here it works. Ready? Gee, Dan, that sounds really amazing. Yeah, it would be really impossible if I was broke too. So your business went like, I don't mind sharing this with everybody listening. It's like, oh no, I lost a million dollars this year. My kids are at home from school. 
and my wife can't substitute teach. And I live with a senior citizen. My mother-in-law lives with us. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been a hell of a year. It's been a hell of a year. Like my business is public speaking, which leads to consulting, which leads to this and this. Yeah. So I basically got napstered. Oh, so you went yeah, online. That's didn't a good way to me, put it. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you, didn't you just tell me you're keynoting the conference for the FPA for Washington DC in like an hour? Like, yes, yes, I did. Do you think they pay me the same to sh- as they do when I used to fly that? No, of course not. I've been heavily commoditized, but thankfully financial planner doing this, doing that, doing all these great things. You got some money stashed away. Yes. Oh, that's good. So you haven't had that stress. Uh, Like it all begins with love yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do it. Oh, as soon as you have, like, look at a lack of money, as they say, doesn't buy you happiness. No, it doesn't. But a lack of it will buy you a lot of misery. Boom. What's money? It's a tool. And if you have enough of it, it'll buy you out out of a lot of trouble. Sometimes trouble is oh, damn, my car's broken and I've got a meeting that's once in a lifetime I can't miss. I better rent a car, buy a plane ticket, do whatever. Sometimes it's that kind of trouble. All money is is a tool. You want to have it. Most people, the stats are crazy. Um, average amount of money in, you know, save for retirement that a 40-year-old has. You know, you and I work in the money business. All we ever meet are people that did it right. There's entirely too many people walking around. Can you imagine? I'm thinking of a guy right now, personal friend of mine. He's over 60. His retirement plan is to work until he's dead. That's his plan, which has, which as a plan manages to both suck and blow at the exact same time. Like that is actually kind of impressive. (laughs) Now, if I were to transport everybody listening in this magical way to this person's home where you could look into their home, see how they live, look at their driveway, look at their toys, we'll call them. You would think, what, this guy? I thought this was the struggler. It's like, he is struggling. Anybody can lease a nice car or two. So there's so many people and it's like, your life sucks. You're just buying distraction. You'd look at this person think, gosh, I'd like to live like him. Of course you would. Fancy cars in the driveway, toys to play with. The house, this house, that uh, seeming, seemingly no reason to say no to anything, including work. And yet working like a dog. If you got money in the bank, this COVID thing blew in. The very first thing Sherry and I were able to say was, well, at least we don't have to worry about that. So, you know, this whole diet, happiness and gratefulness. Okay. So every day, Sherry tells me this every day, this morning, I wake up every morning, have a coffee with Sherry. We have a little visit. She goes, I wake up in the morning, I lie in bed, and I just start listing all the things I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for this. That's what you do in times like this. And thank goodness we're, we didn't put ourselves in a position where right now I'm in some undue amount of stress because I got to go uh, pull $20,000 out of the air. And I, that's, that's the one thing that when, when I'm meeting with, with clients, either new or, or, or current is the question of, well, how do I, how do, how do I compare to everybody else? It's, it's all, it's all relative. And from my standpoint, like I tell people, you have to run your own race. It gets back to what we talked about probably 10 minutes ago during this conversation about yeah. figuring out what it is that you and your family want. Yeah. And it's really, really difficult because you don't necessarily wake up every morning thinking, okay, what do, what do I want my, my lifestyle or financial goals to be? Um, but it's taking that initial first step to saying there's got to be more than just X, saving for retirement, saving for college. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And it, it's the proverbial needs and wants. So one time I was kind of bumming around. There's a line in a song I love, and now we're bumming round, feeling awkwardly at home amidst the dumbing down and the talk shows. That's what he says. Song's called Seem to Recall. I seem to recall. Canadian fella, Ron Sexsmith. Ron Sexsmith. Check him out. Paul McCartney's a big fan. Elvis Costello's a big fan. And he wrote this song called Seem to Recall. 
And it's sort of about the subject we're talking about. I seem to recall, he says, a time when a daydream was all I needed. Okay. I seem to recall doing without, he says. It used to be this haunting song for me because the opening lines in the song, he says, a bad day is when I'm up in the air. Now he means emotionally. Okay. But I took it literally like, yeah, tell me about it. And then he says, like up in the air in the sky and a good day is when I'm in repair. Okay. And I thought, oh, oh, goodness. And it's just this, it's this wonderful, excellent song. So it begins with, you know, like needs and wants. So I'm bumming around feeling awkwardly at home at one time in my life. And my father now departed was a, just a wonderful, gentle, nice man. And he knows where I'm at. He's been there. So he used this term. He goes, Denny, you run at a road. I said, well, how do you mean? He goes, I want you to go back to when you were 16 years old. I think I might have wrote about this at some point in my book or something. I don't know for sure. Though. I wrote about it somewhere. And he said, I want you to go back to your 16, 17, you know, 18-year-old self. What the hell did you think you wanted to be happy? And I knew exactly what I wanted. Okay. And I, like, you know, I'll admit, like, you know, when you're younger, you don't, it's not so much about your purpose as it is your stuff, right? So it's like, I know it was like, I want to own a, I want to have a dog, a Jeep and a jet ski. Okay. That last one, everybody just let me take that one back. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I, at 16, I thought that or 17, that would be really cool. At the time, my, and you know, and again, a girl, obviously a nice girl to spend my time with. So at the time my dad and I were having this conversation, I had a Jeep, Sherry and a dog and the jet ski had left itself. I didn't want anything like that turned into like, you know, a canoe or a whatever. And that was it. My dad says like, look around kid, you made it. Did you make more money last year than you really kind of ever thought you would? And the, the answer was, yeah. Yeah. Like at the time I, I probably was like 20, seven, eight years old. It's like, yeah, things have already gone better than I would have ever dreamed. And he goes, you need to redefine now what happiness is. You ran in a row. You went, you accomplished those things. So now what? And this is, you know, it, it gets a little bit better when you have kids, a little bit easier to see what your purpose is there. But that's a question people really need to sit down and ask each other, right? Is what are we trying to do together? What do we want from our lives? What's the whole point? What does success look like? How would I live differently how would I think differently? And what would I want to think about? How do I want to spend my time? And, and, you know, so as we've moved through, that's, that's always what we've done and it's, it's worked for us really well. And I think that's an area where, again, going back to the whole experience versus service, that's really where I want to get my families to. Mm -hmm. And, but I think a lot of people are scared. They are scared to have that conversation and I think one of the reasons why and just thinking through this and, and having conversations with people like Brian Portnoy as well is that they're afraid to find out that what they've been working on all these years isn't what they wanted. It yeah. goes back to, you know, we, we, we bought all this stuff. We thought we wanted this kind of lifestyle, the status. And then at the end of the day, end of the day, it changed. Yeah. And now they're 40, 50, 60 year, six year old, 60 years old. And now it's like, is it too late? Is it too late to change? And my answer is no. It's never too late to change. And if the best day to start was last year, well, the second best day to start was yesterday. <laughs> and therefore the very best time is right now. <laughs> just, it's never too late, but and I just, all I can hope is that some of the people that are hearing this conversation, are young and they don't go down that mat, like don't go down that rabbit hole of consumption leading to happiness. I read this amazing statistic about, you know, how many double car garages there are in the United States and which percentage of them. You, and it would be the same in Canada that you can't actually park two cars in. Yeah. Because one of the garages is full of stuff, stuff you don't use, stuff you don't need, stuff you don't even know why you had it. And that's the funny thing about stuff versus memories you buy even beautiful stuff. I remember owning a sports car once. Okay. There you go. And I'd be working at my desk and I'd literally go and peek out the window and look at it. Like not stand up, just lean around my monitor and go, I can't believe I own that. Thank you. German engineering. Look at that beautiful thing. Okay. Eventually it just becomes another car. Okay. Eventually I sold it to a kid 
And then I gave him a deal right on the spot. I negotiated myself down because he just amused me. Okay, I'll sell it to you for this. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, you can have it. Like, you're the only kid that's ever come to my house and bought it. Like, he wanted to pay me in installments. You keep the car. I'm just going to keep coming and giving you like $2,000 at a time. I was like, okay, I'll tell you for 10, not whatever then, whatever the hell it was. But just stick with me. The car means less and less. The memory of the morning that I woke up, went to the airport with no bags, T-shirt, you know, like I just... Like I'm always going to airports. That's nothing. Yeah. Briefcases, a roll on an agenda, you know, no, this was like shorts and a t-shirt walked into the airport, sat on an airplane. 45 minutes later, I land in Toronto, jump in a cab. He drags me to some car dealership. Hey, I'm Dennis. Here's this. Thanks for the key. And I'm out and the drive home and listening to Radiohead. <laughs> And there's a line in the song airbag where he says in a fast German car. And I can remember accelerating the memory of the day I bought the car continues to grow. It means more the memory that the experience matters more to me later. The car is just a car. Now, when I drive past them on the road, I used to say, I had one of those. Now I don't care. <laughs> Drives by. It's just a thing. Who do you want to be when you grow up? What's your inspiring vision of success? You know the movie, The Matrix? Yeah. A little mental trick I play. Okay. So for everybody who hasn't seen it, wake up and get with the friggin' program, people, for God's sakes. How many movies from 1999 are still can't miss? That one. Okay. You know the scene where Morpheus brings Neo back into The Matrix? They've had the awakening. He's woken up and realized, oh, it's all an illusion. So now it's like, okay, we're going to go back in now. And they're in the all white space with the chair. And he's explaining, he goes, Neo, calm down. This is the construct. This is where we sort of is a boot up program. This is where we wait to go back into what you have felt is the real world. Just stick with me, Paul, and everybody who's now going to think I'm creepy. Sometimes when I'm tumbling, sometimes when I've lost the ground, oh, and everything's moving a little quick. Honest to God, everybody, I put myself in the construct. God, I'm going to get way honest. Ready? And I'm naked. I just picture myself standing there. <laughs> honest to God, everybody. Honest to God. And then I go, what do I need? Just picture it in the movie. Ready? <laughs> Suddenly there's the biggest pile of currency you've ever seen in your life. Cash piled up like in a movie. So I go, boom, there's me. Next, money. What else do you need? I'm dressed. And I'm dressed like in stuff that'll last forever, okay? Like leather jacket, pair of jeans, pair of boots, black t-shirt, okay? Then what do you need? Literally, dude, visa card, okay? <laughs> For the cash, <laughs> the family, Sherry, <laughs> we're all dressed like, what else do you need? Ready? Nothing. I need clothes, these people, this visa card backed up by that pile of cash. What about your, <clears throat> what about your house in Westboro? No. What about your this? No, none of it. And that's it. When I get lost and I'm running and running, I, that's how I do it. I go, whoa, put yourself in the construct. You need a reboot. What the hell do you need, D? I just need this. There you go. I do it every time. Every time I get lost, that's this little exercise I put myself through. I swear to God. And what it does is remind me of this. If I decided at this moment right now, this was all too much, I'd quit. It's all just a choice. Dear everybody I have appointments with, canceling them all. Reason, I'm done. Do you want to reschedule? No. Done. Because I can afford to do that. As I joked with somebody the other day, you know, there's that terrible expression about when you have enough money, that kind of money. Yeah. To heck with you money, except said with more vulgarity. Right. Okay. So I said, I don't have that much money, but I've got, mm, I don't think so money. <laughs> Thank you. But no, I don't think so money. <laughs> I'm getting closer, but that's it. And that's how I do it. It's like, Hey, at the end of the day, you better make sure you didn't marry that person for the wrong reasons. You better make sure that they just complete you and make you want to be a better person. I'm telling you this right now, a sense of humor goes a long way. The world ain't funny. Funny gets you through. Yay. That's all good. Oh, okay. What else? Okay. Got to get along. That's great. Yeah. You have to have same values about the important things. She likes these movies. I don't. Those things aren't important. Who cares? 
These are our personal values and our beliefs and what we think life is about and how you get there. Those have got to be on. Then you need a plan. You need somewhere to go. Yeah. And that plan involves all your things, spending time together, having fun, saving friggin' money, right? Okay. And, and every 60 days, you better have something fun you're looking forward to. And that's not, oh, we're going out to dinner. No, come on. That's just everyday living. It involves a packs, uh, a suitcase. You're going to go somewhere. You're going to change your reality every 60 days. Okay. And then what about between 60 days? Keep it easy, guys. Don't get yourself too busy, too overcommitted. Don't put yourself on that thing where you're just constantly working to pay your bills. And then all of a sudden, here's what fun is. Fun is drinking too much on Friday or whatever the hell it is. All these joking people do in social media about drinking wine. I always think, uh, yeah. Okay. Every 60 days is fun. And what are the three rules? Be a grown up. Yeah. Keep on listening and talking and communicating. Yeah. And go on, go dates. on dates. We started by, Hey, you know what? If you, if you say to your wife, do you want to go for a, want to walk around the neighborhood? Yeah. Just make sure you hold her hand. As long as you're holding hands, you're on a date because you're showing everybody on the neighborhood. This is my girl. And I love showing up places with her. I like it when you all associate me with her and her with me. That's a date. You can go to a sporting event. We went to a hockey game. Did you hold hands? Yeah. Did you walk to your seat in front of 18,500 fans holding her hand? That's a date. Good for you. And where are you guys going? Well, in about a month, we're going here. There you go. And 60 days after that, we're going here. Life is about making memories. And when you do it together, you're getting somewhere together. You sabotage, that's the word, yourself when you invite other elements into the relationship. Stress. Mo from money. Blah, all that stuff. Like, if you woke up every single day and as and and there is no as good as it gets, come on, where are you going to end up? Like, it's not hard. This is this is exactly why I decided to start this podcast is to have these types of conversations. Um, really, for me, <laughs> hopefully, there's an audience out there listening, which I'm there sure is. there is. The stuff's evergreen; it lasts forever. But in in all honesty, you know, there's so many takeaways from this conversation, and, and I, I I'm sure that I can keep you here for another hour. But I I, I know uh, your time is not infinite, obviously, as we talked about. So I want to end with this question, which is a question I ask of of all my guests: um, is what is the best thing about being a parent? Holy cow! Okay. It's, there's all the answers we've all heard before. Okay. You get to relive it. Da, 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 da. They surprise you and amaze you because they're not you. They're part of you, but they're also part of your wife and all, all that stuff. <clears throat> you know, she looks just like me, but she thinks like Sherry. Oh, she is just like, oh my God, I can remember doing the same thing. All that stuff is great. And it's true. You get to relive it, but it's this, it's love. Okay, so you ready for everybody? Just hear me out. I'm a happily married guy. <laughs> Sherry's heard me say this before, in case anybody's about to wonder. For academic purposes, can I imagine being married to someone else or not being with Sherry? Yeah. I'm not saying I'm running out to do it, but Dennis, I want you to imagine that you're single and the da 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 da. How would you let? Oh, I can do that. Okay. Well, I guess I'd do. I'd do it this way. I can imagine being without my wife. My parents are. I'm now an orphan. I'll have you know, Paul. My folks have now both passed away. My mom died about just like three months ago. Okay. When my parents were alive, or your parents are probably alive, or many people listening, their parents are alive. Yeah, but you can imagine them being dead, right? I mean, for academic reasons, you can imagine what it's going to be like when your parents are no more. What the hell are you going to do at Christmas? <laughs> oh, am I still going to go see my parents? Or are I going to hang out here? Maybe I'm going to go to Florida, whatever your thing is. Okay, great. What about your friends? Do you love your friends? Your friends are pretty great, right? Aren't they awesome? Can you imagine moving to, I don't care, Japan and meeting a bunch of new friends and starting a new life there? It would suck to leave your buddy. He's been your buddy forever. And you accept you probably will never see him again, but you can imagine it. Once you have children, you can never imagine not having them. That's the amazing thing. So just hear me out. It is love that doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside. It changes who you are. You can't 
I can't hear certain things, see certain things, or consider certain things because I am a parent. But all those other things, those, those people, they matter. Yeah, I can imagine all that being gone and never seen again. Really, I can imagine it if you want me to. Dennis, I want you to imagine that something's happened to your children. No, no, and it gives me goosebumps to say it out loud. And when someone says it to me and they go, no, but I'm just saying, just imagine, I literally get offended. No, Paul, you clown, I can't do that. It's impossible for me to imagine that. To even consider imagining it, imagining that is treasonous to myself. And it gets my weird superstitions that I don't even have up. It's such a terrifying idea that I fear if I actually consider it, I can somehow make it happen. So no. And that's the coolest thing about being a dad. It's like, it's a love you've never felt before. And you can't imagine ever undoing it. Ever. Ever. That's the greatest part. And in all the episodes that I've done, that is by far the most interesting answer that I've gotten and one that gives me goosebumps as well, just hearing you talk about it because oh. I'm the same way, same way. Same way. Like, oh my goodness, triplets, <laughs> right? Plus one. <laughs> Plus one. I love that. I know when you, just when you said earlier, when the triplets turned 10, all I thought of was, I can't believe way up in here in Canada, I didn't hear you go, whoo. <laughs> like I should have said, somebody has just got across the finish line somewhere. That's incredible. This has been fun, man. Thanks for it. I appreciate it. It's yeah, really thanks. Good, uh, a fun chat. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dennis. And uh, thanks for being on the on the Emotional Balance Sheet, Balance Sheet podcast. And uh, we'll look forward to having you uh, on again soon, I hope. For sure. Hey, let me say this. Emotional Balance Sheet. That's pretty inspired. You got it. That's, that's something you should be doing a lot with. That's really good. Right? That's really good. I mean that. Anyway, thank Thanks, you, Dennis. brother. Appreciate it. You bet, my man. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Mm-hmm.